morning. morning. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalms 89, 1 through 5. I will sing of your steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens, you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. And we'll have a moment of silent anticipation before we worship. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your fellowship in this church, for giving us the opportunity to gather here and to worship you. I pray that you would prepare our hearts for worship and the hearing of your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. standing uh, while we continue in our Heidelberg Catechism this morning. I'll read the, we have three questions this morning. I'll read the questions and we can all read the answers together. <clears throat> Did God create people so wicked and perverse? No. no. God, God created, created them good, good and in, in his, his own, own image. image. That, that is, in true righteousness and holiness, holiness so, so that, that they, they might truly know God. their 
creates human beings. Love him with all their heart and live with God in eternal happiness to praise and glorify him. Then where does this corrupt human nature come from? The fall and disobedience for our first parents, Adam and Eve, in paradise. This fall has so poisoned our nature that we are all conceived and born in a sinful condition. But are we so corrupt that we are totally unable to do any good and inclined towards all evil? Yes, unless we are born again by the Spirit of God. You may be seated. And I'd like to ask the ushers forward as we prepare to worship through our giving. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this morning and for allowing us to gather in your presence. I pray that you would continue to lead us in a heart of worship as we as we give to you and give to your church, God. I pray that you would bless these tithes and offerings. In Jesus' name, amen.
with the Apostles' Creed. people, I guess you can't hear me. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 7. Before we go there, I want us to lift up the Shetlers, uh, grieving the loss of Lee Shetler. Just such a, he was such a blessing to our community, a great loss for all of us. For the Powell family, who are still grieving the loss of young Jeffrey and, you know, all the other families involved um, as well that are connected to that, and especially our own Derek uh, Simmons. Uh, that, that was his best friend, and young Jeffrey was over there all the time. 
Please keep Janet Boomhofer in your prayers. Uh, she'll be going into surgery to have an ablation at the University of Michigan on Tuesday. And uh, that's a serious uh, procedure, and we pray that it will bring her quality of life. She has a real hard time breathing, and we really need this to work. Okay. Having said that, would you keep the... Let's, let's actually... Pray, make sure we do it, okay? Heavenly Father, we lift up the Shetlers. Oh, such a sweet family. Oh, we'll miss Lee's smile. We're thankful that that smile was passed on to Marion and Randy and Kenny and Patty. And Lord, they're a blessing to our community. Let us all remember to smile. And Father, I know he's enjoying your presence. He was faithful to the end. And let us be faithful to the end. We pray for the Powell family. Just such tragedy there. But we know that you're good and you're doing good. And we trust you, Lord God. And we trust you with these families. Uh, for the Berry family, for the Powells, Lord. God, comfort them as only you can comfort. Our hope is in the resurrection. We hope in you. We, we grieve, but we don't lose hope. And that's the joy of the Christian life. And finally, we lift up Janet, Lord. Would you go with her before her, behind her, guard her life. And we ask that you would help these doctors to succeed and that this procedure would, in fact, bring her a quality of life that she's been missing for nine months now. God, give her patience as she goes through this. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so here we are. 2 Corinthians 10, 7. The purpose of God's word is always to build up. And so even today, if it stings, if it ever stings, you should, you know what? You should just say, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, God. Uh, because he's working in your heart. That That's a good feeling. It should be viewed as a good feeling. That's our title today, God's Word to Build You Up. So even in our context here, when Paul's sharp tone is addressing these false apostles who appointed themselves and are lording it over and bossing around the church in his absence, uh, we see him in this text, uh, even since the first verse, he's going to war. He's going to war against these satanic Apostles, you know, because that's who he's actually going to war. The weapons we've of our warfare are not carnal, you know. Uh, we we wage war against the principalities of darkness, and so he knows Satan is behind all of this. I mean, we should always know Satan is the father of lies. If somebody's lying, somebody's being a tool of Satan. And then he knows that's what's going on, and he goes to war. And so he pulls out his sword. He wields his weapon. And what is his weapon? The same weapon that Jesus Christ used against Satan when he was in the desert, the word of God. And so he pulls it out, and he's, he's going to deal with them, these false apostles. But to us, because this word comes to us down through the ages, it went to the other people in the Corinthian church as well. And it doesn't exactly work that same way. It's not so crushing to those of us who believe. It teaches us. It disciplines us. It guides us. We love it. We love God's word. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. Amen. And so Paul exercises his authority, his jurisdiction over these people, assuring them that he speaks God's authoritative word in order to build them up and not to destroy them. God's word doesn't always feel good, but God's word always does good. God's word destroys self-confidence. God's word destroys self-importance. You may think these things are good because the world tells you they are. It teaches us to esteem God first, not self first, to rely on God and not be self-reliant. If you're self-reliant, my friend, you're in trouble. God made us not to be independent of himself. That's what Adam and Eve did. 
Being independent of God, being independent, that's not a good thing. Not in the spiritual sense, okay? The greatest self-respect a person can have is to respect God first, who forgives the disrespectful. That's you and I. By nature, we have plenty of self-love. This is not a popular message, by the way, in our culture. You're told to love yourself. First. Well, you've got to love yourself first before you can love others. If you love yourself first before... It, let's thread this needle according to Scripture, okay? By nature, we have plenty of self-love. What we need is more God-love, okay? So let's go. What, what were the greatest commandments? The Jesus' greatest commandments were where? Well, we find them in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 39. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. But we're born, as we confessed this morning, self-centered sinners. What's a sinner? A sinner is they who put themselves before God and others. Sinners don't need more self-esteem. They need less. By loving others as themselves. That's how you have less self-esteem and self-love. Notice Jesus never said, hate yourself, don't, not to love yourself. Of course you did. You, most of you brushed your teeth this morning. And those of you who didn't, shame on you. <laughs> but uh, anyways, we, we take care of ourselves. We take care of our bodies. We do love ourselves, and we ought to love ourselves. But if you love yourself at everybody else's expense, including God, you'll hate yourself in this life and the next life to come for an eternity. So when we expose ourselves to the purity of God's word, we see our own impurity, and it doesn't always feel good, does it? But Paul demands, or he, he reminds us today, God's word is here to build you up. And so to get our foundation square, sometimes the old self has to be torn down in order to build it back up. The word of God rebuilds us on the rock, the solid rock of Jesus Christ. The word never changes like the ever-shifting sands of this world's beliefs. Please stand for the reading of God's word this morning and you'll see what I'm talking about. As he's directing his comments toward these false apostles. Verse seven, look, look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ's, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ, so also are we. For even if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave us for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. I do not want to appear to be frightening you with my letters, for they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech of no account. Let such a person understand that what we say by letter when absent, we do when present. Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves by one another, they are without understanding. These are the very words of God as spoken through the Apostle Paul. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you this morning. We love your word. Please renew our minds in your word today, only as you are able to do by the power of your Holy Spirit to quicken our minds that we might comprehend. And Lord, so be uh, motivated to act upon your word and to do your will as it is in heaven. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. You may be seated. So let's look at verse seven and go verse by verse through this. You know, normally this would not be a section, if, a, if I was a cherry picker preacher, and there are a lot of cherry picker preachers who cherry pick, you know, sermons and texts that excite a congregation. But 
We're here to go verse by verse through the word of God. There's no wasted scripture. There's no wasted passage. There's plenty here. But this is not a particular passage filled with theological stuff. I mean, it's just pretty straightforward. But there's plenty here to guide us and instruct us today. Look at this verse 7. Look at what is before your eyes. If anyone's confident that he is Christ, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ, so also are we. Paul addresses those claiming exclusive, exclusive access to Christ. As we've said, the Corinthian way was to bait. They debated. That was Greek. That was, that was the, philosoph- the, the home of the philosophers in Athens and in, in Corinth. And they would debate all sorts of philosophers and take sides. And I, I'm, you know, an Epicurean or I'm a Stoic or I'm a, uh, I, I believe in... Uh, Aristotle or uh, the Socrates, and they all had minor differences, and they'd debate and argue over and over and over, but it was causing division in the church. This is not how we act in the church. And so Paul addresses them. Uh, go, go with me to 1 Corinthians 1, 12. I want you to see it, because these two verses, there's only a year in between the two, or these two books, there's only a year in between them when Paul wrote these letters to them to try and correct their behavior. And so he starts out with the fact that they're argumentative, okay? So look at verse 12 of chapter 1 in 1 Corinthians, and you'll see that it harmed the unity of the church. Uh, Look at verse 12. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas, that's Peter, Uh, And then finally, this last group, I follow Christ. You guys can, but I follow, I'm following Christ. We're more spiritual than you are. And this was the group who thought they were superior. You may follow Peter, Paul, or Apollos, but we, we answer directly to Christ. Sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds good. Well, I would be tempted to say that's what you ought to do. No, they're troublemakers. They're self-appointed false apostles with special access to God. Okay. And we have a lot of those God told me type people running around uh, in churches today. Self-nominated people claiming to speak for God. Claiming that they hear God audibly. I mean, have you ever had anybody say that to you? Did you know that in the Bible... We only have three instances outside of the discussion between Adam and Eve and and God in the beginning. But after the fall, we only have three instances where God spoke audibly. I guess you could say he spoke through an ass, too, that one time. But but basically, God to human, it was only only, uh, three times. And that was on the top of the mountain, and the people asked him to shut up. Please beg him, beg him. Moses, tell him to be quiet. We're going to die. His voice is terrifying to us. And then we had it when God spoke, when Jesus was baptized. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased, right? And then we had it at the Mount of Transfiguration three times. Yet we have these people running around America in churches, going to church to church, saying God spoke to them audibly. If you want to hear God speak to you audibly, Open the Bible and start reading it out loud. There you have it, okay? You can hear God speaking to you audibly if you need that. If that's what your faith requires, then then do it that way. And so Peter, when we look at him, he did have special access to Jesus Christ as an apostle. His jurisdiction was the Jews. Paul also had a direct line to Christ. Unusual, unique. These apostles were unique. They could do miracles. It was awesome. And they had a direct line to Christ, but Paul's was to the Gentile. He was called, he, even though he wanted, he would have rather been an apostle to the Jews, he was given the jurisdiction of the Gentile people. And then you have Apollos that they're arguing about. He was a great orator, a great preacher. You would have wanted to listen to him before you listened to any of these other ones. He was just articulate and nice to listen to. 
you know, ear candy. He was good, but he didn't, uh, Aquila and Priscilla had to instruct him in the way of the Lord because he, did, he was only uh, acquainted with the baptism of John the Baptist. And so he answered to Aquila and Priscilla, who answered to who? To Paul. So uh, now you got these people who claim this last group, that they are Christ's, they claim. Insulated from any sort of examination because they've heard directly from God. And you can't question anything that they say. They're troublemakers. They're self-appointed. They're know-it-alls. They thrive on knowing something you don't know. Have you ever run into people? It's an old playbook by Satan. The Gnostics did this in the, in the last century. Uh, but it, 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 it's what John had, the apostle had to deal with as well. But he loves to use a person's pride to deceive them and other people. Look again at verse 7. Go back to our text in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 7. And so he's saying, if anyone is confident that he is Christ, and who we are addressing, these false apostles, he's saying, let, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ, so also are we. Paul says, think, think again. Think about it. If you're an apostle, your access to Christ is no better than mine. And the problem is, we disagree on what God's saying. So who's right and who's wrong? God's not wrong. And I'm not wrong. Because I know I'm called by Jesus Christ. I know that I am. God's not wrong. I'm not wrong. So who's wrong? We've got a disagreement here. Something's got to give. You're a bunch of satanic liars. That's exactly what he's saying. And if you don't think that he is... You can check it out. He finally spits it out. Go with me to chapter 11. Just turn a page. Then you'll see it. That's why it's so important we look at all the context. When we're trying to interpret what Scripture is saying, we look at what's before and what's after, what is actually going on in the whole context of these letters. And what does he say in verse 5? Indeed, I consider that I am not in the least inferior to these what? Super apostles. His accusers literally claim superiority over him. He was called by Christ personally on the road to Damascus. What's he supposed to do? Let him run over him? Let him take charge? And this is what some pastors do when these folks show up in a church. They let him run all over him. Go down to verse 13. He calls them what they are. Well, that's not very nice. We like our pastor to just be nice and let, let people run all over him and have false teaching in the church. That's what we like. Just everybody be nice. That's all we care about. Everybody, peace, peace, peace at the expense of truth. And what does he say? He calls them, he said, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. They're liars. What is false? False is a lie. What's deceitful? Deceitful is a lie. What's disguising themselves? Disguising themselves as a lie. They're liars. Who's the father of lies? Who's he fighting against? He's going to war. He's not messing around. He's calling them what they are. But this is the constant backstabbing that he has to deal with. All the while fighting false doctrine to establish the foundation of the early church. I mean, it's the template by which we live by. And on top of all this, he's literally running for his life. He just escaped being killed just before writing this second letter. He just escaped Ephesus where a mob chased him down. <laughs> I mean, you can imagine, well, I'm alive here. And you know what? I don't need to take this anymore from these liars. I'm going to call them out. I might as, well, might as well go out swinging, you know. He's hunted down like a dog. How, how, how would you like to live that way? And so we don't just make up our conclusions 
about what this text is saying and when we say his tone has changed here in chapter 10. It really has. And this is how we interpret the Bible properly. Go to back to verse 8 with me of chapter 10. For even if I boast a little too much of our authority, do you like anybody? People, people hate a brag, braggart, don't they? Anybody who's kind of pushing people around. And he's saying, I'm, I'm pressing the limits of this here. For even if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave, and what's the purpose? You know, the purpose for the authority that we're given in God's word, the ultimate aim, if it's not to build people up, you're doing the wrong thing. It's not to destroy. I will not be ashamed, though. He says, I will not be ashamed. He's saying, I won't back down. I should, we should sing that song. Should we sing that song? You want to sing a song? Do you really? Okay. courage in the church. I mean, there's fear projected everywhere. And it's time that the church stands up. You know, and Tom Petty was fighting with his record company when he wrote that song. So that's kind of, you know, but I love the words. It's great. It's kind of weird when you start singing, hey, baby, though. So, <laughs> you know. But Paul was a special apostle to the Gentiles, endued with power, endued with authority that they would never be able to claim. They couldn't do the miracles that Paul did. And he didn't go around doing miracles to prove that he was apostle. He did it when God decided that's what needed to happen. I mean, he pleaded with the Lord to take the thorn of, uh, in his flesh away from him and God didn't answer that prayer. I mean, it wasn't as if he could walk around and name and claim and blab and grab, you know. So he healed people when it was necessary and when it was time. But he's saying, I'm not turning in my badge just because you guys love to boss everybody around. He reminds everyone the authority God gives is to build up, not destroy. And what are they doing? They're dividing the church. He's building the church. He's been patient with these false apostles. It's been years. It's not like a knee-jerk reaction that he's having toward them. But now they need to bow to God's word. God's word is to build, but it's a blowtorch to its enemies. Uh, the word can speak life. The word can bury a soul. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable to, for teaching, for, listen to this, for teaching, for reproof, for correcting, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, complete, equipped for every good work. Go back to verse 8 with me. To the authority, 
Do you see that word in there? Of the inspired word which the Lord gave to Paul. Look, what was it for? For building you up. So all, as we look at that, all scriptures God breathed for teaching, reproof, correction, and training. What's teaching? Teaching is doctrine. Teaching is the foundation of the church. Jesus said, teach them everything I've commanded you. We're making disciples, followers of Jesus Christ, disciplined by the teachings of Christ. Do you know the teaching? The, the, we said the greatest commandments. Teaching them to obey everything I commanded, he told the apostles. What are the, what are the great commandments? Love God, love others. Boy, that really, you know, you'll spend a lifetime on those two. And as we said last week, uh, to love God are the first four commandments. They're still in play, folks. And you can't obey any of them. And the last six are toward our fellow man. Do not steal, do not murder, do not lie. You see, and, and we're failures. But we come to church, we, in our personal lives, we read the Bible that this scripture may teach us doctrine. Sound doctrine. Watch your doctrine, the Bible says. And reprove us. What does reproof mean? If you look it up in the dictionary, it means blame. Oh, I got to go to the Bible to be blamed? Yes, it's your fault, not God's. And Jesus took your fault. Jesus took responsibility for everything you did wrong. He took the blame. It's your fault. Everybody say, it's my fault. It's my fault. There you go. You're on your road to glory. But as long as, you, as long as you say that that's not the case, you're fighting against God. You're opposing him. And you're saying the cross wasn't necessary. You're not to blame. You didn't do anything wrong. That's a godless ideology. And then what's the other? Correction. What's that? To correct something is to go back in the books and rectify an error, error that you made. Right? So if you're walking in... Uh, in a way that's not correct, that is not right, well, the word of God will reprove you. It will correct you. Then finally, it trains us. You know, Brahms over at our house all the time shooting his, his bow and his arrow because he wants to be ready to get that big buck this fall, you know, and that's what we do. A basketball player shoots free throws, you know. This is what we do. We train. We get ready. It's, it's good for training. And so if you've heard me repeat things over and over, well, that's good. We repeat the 23rd Psalm. We repeat the Apostles' Creed. We do these things so that we're reminded we're training ourselves in righteousness. We're in training, folks. Are you flabby? Man, I'll tell you, COVID-19 has kicked my hiney. I gained 30 pounds. Can you believe that? Fat pig that I am. But anyway... No, I'm losing weight. I'm on a diet now. I'm in training. But God's word is the means by which God authors and finishes our faith. God's word is the means by which God authors and finishes. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He's, he's going to complete us for every good work. The Bible says, in Romans 10, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of God. God wants to complete this faith in your life. And you got to have his word. You got to have his. Paul leaves then in the context of what's going on here. He leaves no room for these false apostles to think he's messing around. But he does leave room for them to repent. He actually leaves room for them to repent. I mean, you'd be tempted by now to just blow him away. His desire is not to destroy. But for years, they've refused to obey him. He's God's mouthpiece. He's got, he knows he's God's mouthpiece. And they're disobeying. And because of their pride, they prove to be exactly what he calls them, liars. Turn back there to this verse 11, chapter 11, excuse me. Go back to verse 13. I want you to look with me because this is exactly what he's driving at. He calls them false apostles. He calls them deceitful workmen in, in verse 13. He calls them uh, people who are disguising themselves as apostles. 
And what are the, how are they doing that? They're, they're making themselves, listen to me, they make themselves look like Christians. Do you understand? They're here today to deceive you. We have them all over in the church. You shouldn't be surprised. I've said this before. Satan focuses his efforts in the church. The world's already going to hell. He doesn't need to mess with them. He focuses his energies in the church to divide and mess up the church. Look at what it says in verse 14 and 15. He calls them Satan's servants in as much words, disguised as servants of righteousness. And so Satan is the father of lies. It all begins with him. That's what he loves to do. Don't be naive. It goes on in the church today. And we need to pray for pulpits to stand strong. We need pulpits on fire across America. Have you been praying for pulpits in America? We need it. We need, where are they? And we got one guy over there, a national figure, John MacArthur in Los Angeles, who's taken a lot of heat for a lot of people, and he might be going to jail this week because the governor is disallowing him from gathering. And you can go online and listen to the reasons that he gives, and they're good reasons. We gather. That's what the saints do. Uh, what was our text today? It even said it, I noticed in our text, when, when Ray called us to worship, he stopped at, I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Selah, we paused and then he prayed. But then it goes on to say, let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. The gathering, the assembly is exactly what church means. And this has been going on for centuries, even back into the Old Testament. And he takes the heat, but we need for our pulpits to be on fire. Okay, so um, go back now to verse 9. I do not want to appear to be frightening you by my letters. Okay, so this confirms. This is one of the verses that explicitly supports our exposition that Paul's tone has in fact changed. So if you were saying, how do you get that, John? I don't get that his tone. Well, now you know. He's concerned. He's concerned. He's, he's, he's severe in his language. Not sinfully severe. He's holy. He's apostolic. No nonsense. No messing around. Paul admits that he's being severe here. But he's not going to allow him to think he's just huffing and puffing by letter and that he won't be backing it up in person. Like he said, go back to verse one of chapter 11. I, Paul, myself, entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I am, I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I'm away. He's addressing their accusation that he's a, a wimp when he's in public, you know. He's saying, yeah, I'm meek when I'm with you, but I beg you, don't, Push me. Don't make me. I don't want to discipline you. This should be the heart of every pastor, every father. I don't want to discipline you. I don't go around. That's This thing with the masks and people who anoint themselves Barney Fife's telling everybody who can and who can't wear a mask. It's like, are you serious? You're making $7 an hour and you're, okay, you're the boss. Um, it's frustrating. When people act like that and push themselves in such a way. Pastors should never do that. Paul doesn't want to do that. Fathers shouldn't do that with their children. I've got authority. Look at me. I've got authority. Ugh, I hate that when people do that. But he knows his letter is going to be read by a lot of people. Including the faithful and the repentant that he had addressed in the first nine chapters of this book. They had come to repent of their disobedience, and they saw the wisdom of Paul's words in the first, uh, in his first letter. And so, they needed to be reminded because they're hearing this as well that it, the word of God is to build them up and not to destroy them. And we need to hear that today too. Even when it stings, we need to know that this is for our good and not for our bad. 
And he's saying, I want my words to build you up, but I want my words to shut up the liars. That's what I would like. And so Paul's been patient, preaching God's word. And when he preached God's word and wrote God's word in these letters, they opposed, these words of his opposed the false apostles' words. And so now the church is divided. But these false apostles, it's been years now, they're acting like, what are you going to do? Tickle me, Paul? I mean, what are you going to do? Give me a spanking? What are you going to do? You can't throw me in jail. What are you going to do, Paul? They're taunting him, you know, like a rebellious child with a frazzled mom, like Harrison used to do to Margaret, you know, <laughs> till dad got home. It's true. Anyway. Verse 10, for they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak. His letters are weighty. That means they're impressive. They're strong. That means they're severe, authoritative. But his bodily presence is weak. We need to keep in mind he's old. He's nearing the end of his life. He's endured several beatings uh, that marred his bodies. So his so his body, so his posture is probably compromised when, they, when he comes. And so look, his bodily presence is weak. Look what it says, verse 10. And his speech of no account. He's God's mouthpiece. And they're saying his speech is of no account. His letters have authority, but when you see and hear him in person, he's no Apollos. He's not eloquent. They're cutting him down behind his back. It's like you expected Trump and you got Biden. But to say this about God's mouthpiece, that's like blasphemy. Now look at verse 11. Let such a person understand that what we say by letter when absent, we do when present. So it's not an idle threat. What he condemns in his letter, he condemns in their presence. He'll exercise authority over the church by God's word to build her up, not to destroy and so when liars tear down a church and divide a church, we're going to deal with them, Paul says. I hope and pray that we who preach in this church, Vogi, Ryan, Stefan, we who preach in this church are brave to correct also when we're with people, you know, and that we would be meek, that we would be humble around people, but that we would also be brave enough to say, oh, that's not right, that's not right. That's hard to do, you know? I don't like to do that. And that's where pastors mess up, as they don't have the guts to speak truth. Somebody starts gossiping, we well, gotta shut it down. And that's a good thing to do. Verse 12. We don't want anybody to threaten the unity of, of the church, right? And you should do that too. Just to, Some of you are better than others, but boy, I always marvel at someone who is just able to thread the needle and somebody starts gossiping and they just all of a sudden they clam up. They just don't have anything to say. You know, and they don't want to go there. And that's a good thing. And we all ought to learn to do that. But then if we're in a position of authority in the church, sometimes things have to be corrected. Or if somebody's living in sin, blatant sin, then, then leaders have to be willing to speak into that. And you get frustrated with leaders when they don't. You know, why are they letting them get away with murder? I've heard people say that time again in the church. Why don't, why don't they, they, who's they? Well, it's leaders. So let a, such a person understand that what we say by letter when absent, we do when present. Not, verse 12, that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves. He's insulting them. He's outright insulting the false apostles that everybody's been tolerating. He's saying false apostles are not the standard by which we measure ourselves. God is. And we should all learn not to to measure ourselves by other people. They, these false apostles, divide. 
We built. That's what we're doing. They're dividing. So, verse 12, not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. They don't get it. They're ignorant of the standard. And it's common in the church today. Somebody's got a common sense idea, you know, an idea that the, the, the consensus of people have all agreed to in this world. It sounds like common sense, uh, conventional wisdom, whatever. But it doesn't agree with the Bible. And you have to take a stand against that kind of thing. And when a pastor's not teaching the word of God in his church, the standard slides to worldly values in the church. And without a gauge to evaluate themselves, insecure sheep begin to judge righteousness by other people's behavior. Wrong standard. Instead of the holiness of God, that's the right standard. It's a vicious cycle of trying to measure up to other people's expectations. I don't know if you've ever been on that vicious treadmill trying to please everybody all the time. Well, it's not. It's worse when it gets to God if you don't know Jesus because God expects perfection. He's holy. He expects per perfection. He cannot look upon sin. He also expects us to trust his son who accomplished perfection. And that's the difference. That's the difference. When we don't measure up to God's standards, ah, he's doing a good work in you. You're seeing your sin. You repent. You get on your knees. And all who confess their sins, he's faithful and just to forgive their sins and cleanse them from all unrighteousness. That's our Christian life, my friend. And there's much peace in it. In other cases, you have believers fail when they don't, like the way God makes them feel when they read God's word. And by the way, do you think that might be the reason why so many people struggle with reading God's word? But they don't like the way it makes them feel. So again, they prefer to judge themselves by an easier standard of comparing themselves to the unholiness of others. You know, the common denominator of unholiness. What's everybody else doing? That's easy. Well, at least I'm that good. At least I'm not as bad as that. At least I didn't have an abortion. At least I'm not a pedophile. At least I'm not this. And then they feel good. Oh, I'm ready. I'm good. I know. By this standard, you'll go to hell. That is not the standard by which we measure ourselves. You might succeed in convincing others you're a Christian, but you're putting your faith in your own righteousness. What's that called? Self-righteousness. That's self-righteousness. And only Jesus is righteous in himself. Without faith alone in righteousness of Christ alone, you will never be saved if you put your trust in yourself. It's ugly. Appointing yourself, nominating yourself as leader, like these false apostles did, divides a church. You'll never be saved by saying or thinking that you're good. No one does good. No, not one. The Bible says, Romans 3. The Bible says, at your best, how do you like this? You're a filthy rag. Thanks, John, for such an uplifting message Sunday. I'm a filthy rag. I can't ever do good. Great. You know, but I hope you're understanding the beauty of all this. One of our many successful mothers here, and you'd agree, came to me humble, feeling like a failure. She felt God's conviction when you see your utter, utter inability to live for God the way you need to, God's doing good. God's at work. Don't be angered by God's word. Be humbled by it. Because nobody measures up to God's word. No one. But we can ask forgiveness. And we can ask his help to help us be righteous. To help us do good. He promises by the Holy Spirit to do that. But what I saw in this mother was the Holy Spirit convicting her by the, by the word of God, by God's standard. She was wrong and she knew it. I tried to encourage her, but she wouldn't allow a standard of comparing herself to others. 
It was the word of God tearing her down to build her up, being humbled by the correction of God's word. It's actually edifying. It actually builds you up. It really does. But I wonder, are you rifling through your mind who this is now? Are you guilty right now, this moment? Are you guilty of comparing yourself to other people? Stop it. Don't do it. Stop it. And we all have a tendency there. We live in a culture that can't be humbled. We live in a culture that just loves the lie that we're doing everything right. Oh, you're so good. We'll tell somebody who's saying off tune that they sung great. You know, we'll do this kind of thing all the time because we're all supposed to be doing this. And what does it do? It props up our self-esteem. And what is self-esteem? Self-esteem is pride. And what comes after pride? Pride comes before what? A fall. It's a bad thing. It, it all works to Satan's end. He wants to produce people with no grasp of reality. Listen to me. It explains all the anarchy and destruction that surrounds us right now in our culture. Handing out constant participation trophies gets you the unhinged wackos we have burning the place down. Just whacked. And that we have a church in our neighborhood where they went and profane behind the pulpit. They spray painted behind the pulpit. Rainbow stuff. And we had rainbow flags put stuck in our stuff here. You know, don't be surprised if somebody tries to deface our property because we preach the truth and it's going out on the internet. And there are plenty of young kids hate it. They hate it. And it's, it can be discouraging. They have no standard of measurement. They have no standard of right or wrong. But we do. We have God's word. It not only points out our sin, it points us to the one who cleanses our sin. And helps us to live by the standard of that righteousness. This is being built up. It's his rod and his staff that comforts us. As his word leads us, where? In paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Amen. And so furthermore, just to close here, verse 12, they commend themselves. Seriously, they're going to commend themselves. That's self-righteousness. There's no goodness in self. There's only goodness and righteousness in Jesus Christ. We're, again, we're filthy rags. And so we commend Christ alone. Even though no one likes criticism, I hate criticism, but I have to listen to it. It's important that I listen to it. It's important we come to Scripture and get credit. I don't want to get credit. Well, you're going to because you're a sinner. And the Bible's going to point it out. I just pray we can be brave enough to walk in the light of God's word that exposes our sin so we can repent and offer our sin to a, to a merciful God who's so gracious to forgive us. He really is. Let's take an opportunity to do that right now. Would you bow in prayer? Take it right home in your own heart, the light of God's word. Are you a sinner? Yes, you're a sinner. You know you're a sinner. And as long as we're general, as long as we're nebulous about that sin, you're just happy as, a, happy as can be. But how about you get real specific? Do you read his word as you should? Do you build your life up in his most holy word? Do you know what it says? Do these teachings come as a surprise to you? When, when something like self-esteem is attacked in a, in a message from God's word, because self-esteem is so preached in this world. Self-esteem, self-esteem, self-esteem. No, Christ's esteem. He alone is worthy. What do you think those words mean in the Bible? They correct our thinking. They renew our mind. Repent of not reading God's word as you should. 
Repent and begin to commit yourself to reading his word so you can walk in the light as he is in the light and so that we might have fellowship with God and one another according to 1 John 1, 7. Oh, Lord, help us repent. God, renew our minds by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand? And it's good to gather in his name, isn't it? The fellowship of the saints has been going on for centuries. We gather, we gather in the name of Christ. Let's sing uh, Glory Be to the Father. Let's do that one, okay? You all know it? Mm, glory be to the Father. Love one another. Mike Guza, I love you. I got to get out there and swing the club. Are you there tomorrow?